Welcome to another research spotlight episode. Today I am hosting Kane Bastik from St. Andrews University. Kane did his master's degree in natural sciences at Durham University and currently he is a PhD student under the supervision of Professor Alan Watson. He mainly working on the synthesis of methodology involving correlated molecules during his PhD thesis. He is currently an academic secondment to the Max Planck Institute, working in the reaction design group under the supervision of Dr. John Molly. Kane, thank you for accepting our invitation and followers is yours. Firstly, before I get started, thank you, Matt, for inviting to speak to me today about my two combined studies that made up the bulk of my PhD. So diol methanes and benzyl CC bonds are prevalent throughout medicinal chemistry. Um, and here are just a few examples. Many of these are diol methanes um, that also contain CX bonds. In particular, you've got carbon nitrogen and carbon oxygen, although um, there are other examples such as CS um, in the case of modafinil. So while a medicinal organic chemist might consider a variety of strategies to access these compounds, the analysis of the pattern literature generally points towards more classical transformations being used industrially to access these compounds. Taking bifonazole as an example, a friedel crafts acylation of biphenyl yields a ketone, which is reduced in the pressure vessel to the benzhydrol, and subsequent substitution um, using catalytic bromide in an excess of imidazole yields the product in generally good yields. The problem with these sorts of strategies though with, lies with accessing more complex functional groups required to be able to develop new medicines um, for and via an appropriate SAR type approach. Um, so being able to develop a route that doesn't require high temperatures, reductants or the use of uh, compounds such as thionyl chloride are highly desirable um, for use in industry. One strategy that could be used uh, to address this problem is the application of organoboron chemistry. So specifically the use of these benzyl organoboron compounds that could be used in a divergent manner to access um, CC, CN and CO bonds. So um, benzyl CC bond formation would come from the Suzuki coupling, while CX bond formation can come from the Chan Lam. Naturally, the strategy came from uh, the Watson Group's general interest in organoboron chemistry. We are interested in developing a thorough mechanistic understanding of organoboron compounds in relation to industrially relevant processes. Classically, within mechanism methodology, this has been focused on both copper and palladium catalysis. Although more recently, we've also applied um, organoboron compounds towards rhodium catalyzed 2 plus 2 plus 2 cycloadditions, as well as photoredox based cross coupling. This work has also been culminated over the years in a series of medchem, agrochem, and total synthesis campaigns that have used um, our developed methodology and mechanistic understanding in organoboron chemistry. So moving back to this intended approach, and when we wanted to apply these benzyl bronic esters to each of these cross couplings, we were surprised to learn that very few compounds of this nature were, at, were commercially available or even reported, despite um, benzyl bronic esters initially looking like quite simple molecules to make. When we surveyed a number of commercial suppliers, you can see that there is a huge deficit between the number of aval organoboron compounds versus benzyl, and this is excluding all heterocycles as well. So what is going on here? And we, want, we wanted to try and justify this by looking at methods of making boronic esters. Now, typically uh, the two methods that most people would turn to is either um, a methylation um, borylation type route through lithium halogen exchange or a mura borylation. Now, the issue with the benzylic position lies with the boronic acid intermediate that would occur through lithium halogen exchange, trapping with a borate followed by hydrolysis and esterification. So these benzyl bronic acids intermediates are very unstable. If you try and go through um, a benzyl BF3K, for example, and do a deprotection with TMS chloride, you'll see almost an immediate puff of white smoke um, that is consistent with HF um, coming off and then followed by immediate protoborination. Mural borylations are generally very good on aval bromides, um, but benzyl bromides can be very sluggish and so often require either ligand systems or higher catalyst loadings that are simply not viable commercially for use. So what is the alternative? 
The alternative to access specifically a benzoyl bonding tester or a general strategy was developed by Matteson um, way back in 1960. Um, in this case, a chloromethyl lithium, which is uh, prepared from butyl lithium and DCM, inserts into the vacant P orbital on, on a boronic ester to form an A complex. Subsequent warming to room temperature furnishes a stereospecific 1 2 metallate rearrangement and expulsion of chloride leading to a net insertion of a CB bond um, and a net homologation. Now, this chemistry can be used in a similar manner using alpha halogenated bronic esters using with an organometallic reagent and a subsequent 1 2 metallate rearrangement here furnishes the secondary bronic ester into me, um, reagent product. This methodology has been developed extensively over the years um, and in the last two decades there have been significant contribution by the Ardvold group in particular, who now accesses chiral secondary and tertiary bronic esters using configurationally stable metallated carbonoids. While yields can often be pushed to nearly quantitative um, and with full stereo control in uh, Ardvold and Madison based methodologies, in particular the application towards uh, these platform-based syntheses in iterative methods. Some of the practical aspects of the Madison homologation are still unattractive from an industrial perspective. And this may form some of the justification behind the lack of benzoyl bronic esters commercially available. So if we want to do this um, Madison homologation to generate a benzoyl bronic ester, we need to flame dry a flask um, and remove any moisture and then add um, dry solvent and DCM and cool right down to between minus 90 and minus 110 Celsius. The reason for this is because the methylated carbonoid that you generate um, through very slow addition of um, butyl lithium um, is extremely unstable um, and will degrade it almost immediately on warming to even minus your normal minus 78 Celsius. This can often mean that syringe pump addition is required over hours um, and posi even positioning of the syringe is important um, to pre-cool um, your organometallic reagent down the side of the flask. Once addition has been complete, then you can add in the bronic ester um, as a single portion and then slowly warm up to room temperature um, and stir overnight to promote the 1-2 metallate rearrangement. What we really wanted to do, though, is try to um, offer a conceptual redesign to this hematsen homologation so that no stoichiometric methylation and prolonged cryogenic cooling was required. Ideally, this would be an operationally simple reaction that can be done in mild conditions for use um, in industrial reactions. And we wondered whether we could use a stable surrogate to the methylated carbonoid that could be used with that same bifunctional reactivity with um, our desired B-pin, linchpin and a leaving group. And rather than relying upon a 1-2 metallate rearrangement, we considered whether we could use transition metal catalysis with a second organoboron compound. Rather than doing the 1-2 metallate rearrangement, this reaction would require oxidative addition of a halo alcohol boronic ester and chemoselective transmethylation of a boronic acid substrate. An initial screening campaign um, identified this, uh, this HIT reaction here, um, and it was promising for a few reasons. Other than just seeing our desired product, we didn't see any boronic acid homocoupling, but probably what was most important was that there was no polymerization encountered, which is often a risk in classical mass and chemistry. This meant that what we could see, the desired homologation um, was not re-engaging with palladium, and homologation could be adequately controlled. A byproduct that we did encounter, though, was this um, speciation product, where essentially pinnacle has fallen off from the carbanion surrogate and clipped back onto the boronic acid. While boronic esters have been known to transmetallate directly, um, control studies using these conditions um, and the speciated byproduct as the starting material showed that this product byproduct could not re-engage with palladium under, under our conditions. So considering that both starting materials and both products um, in a single reaction vessel, what we were observing is an impressive level of, of chemoselective transmethylation with four different organoboron compounds um, in a single pot um, and us being able to get transmethylation with only a single one of these compounds. So this reaction went under standard optimization and we were eventually able to switch this bias away from um, this undesired speciation reaction to our desired homologation. This reaction uses a relatively a pretty low loading of palladium catalyst 
but what's also remarkable is we don't need any complex ligand systems and can use arguably the most common palladium zero catalyst out of the glove box to do this chemistry. Instead of generating a highly reactive water and temperature sensitive um, methylated carbonoid in situ, we have replaced this with a commercially available and, sta and relatively stable halomethyl boronic ester. We use stoichiometric water in this reaction as well to control speciation, and therefore we also don't need rigorously dry solvents in order to do this reaction. So before we went into the stroke, we really wanted to have a think about um, the mechanism and what was going on here. Um, and all of the components effectively made this um, homologation reaction a suzuki mural cross-coupling. We did several control studies using um, to, in order to rule out a possible single electron transfer mechanism. And today, what I really want to focus on is this initial odd state of addition step, because we were surprised that it ha could happen at all. While beta hydride elimination isn't a possible byproduct formation in this cross-coupling, what was remarkable is that we, we seemed to see um, a facile sp3, sp2 Suzuki cross-coupling um, without the requirement for any complex ligand systems and thought that there was a potential influence of the boron atom in our homologation reagent was allowing this reaction to take place. So we wanted to try and study the anatomy of um, our homologation reagent a little bit further and undertook this SAR study. You can see that when we use bromobenzene or benzyl bromide as our electrophile under our conditions, the cross-coupling um, rather predictably works well. When you then move into cyclohexyl, pentyl and the dioxalane, um, which incurs a similar um, structure to the bromomethyl B-pin, there's no reaction at all. And then when we add boron atom back in, um, in the form of our um, surrogate um, carb anion, the reaction immediately works. Now, this sort of reactivity of different electrophiles can be predicted um, a priori based on NMR shifts, which is especially useful for chemoselective cross-coupling. However, in our case, this a priori analysis was completely useless um, and we were unable to justify what we were seeing initially um, based on solution shifts alone. Probably the most impressive result um, from these um, empirical studies um, came from taking the con standard conditions and doping the reaction mixture with a competing phenyl electrophile. In a prototypical Suzuki example, one would normally predict an sp2 halide to always be more reactive than an sp3 halide. But in all cases other than iodobenzene, we actually observed the reverse therefore getting um, chemoselective oxidative addition as well. When bromobenzene is used, the bromomethyl B-pin is still the dominant product with a selectivity score of 1.27, equating to a 56% bias in favor of the SB3 product over the SB2. When we start to then uh, dig into the anatomy of the homologation reagent further, um, we can start to establish some empirical features that govern this homologation. The halide itself seems generally unimportant, with the chloride likely being less reactive and the iodide being less thermally stable. Similar yields can be afforded using the iodomethyl bonic ester if you increase the stoichiometry. And again, this is consistent with this reagent being slightly less stable under our condition. This reactivity that we've observed also appears to be dependent on specific alpha relationship between the halogen carbon and the boron carbon bonds. Now, we are unable to access beta bromoethyl B pin um, due to elimination, so this is actually synthetically inaccessible. But when we use the gamma B, um, propyl B pin homologation reagent in the center right, this three carbon dome is quantitatively recovered um, and does not engage with palladium at all. While the yield is poorer for the neopentaglycol ester, it does work. Um, but you can see with the ethylene glycol ester, um, reactivity entirely shuts down. And this can be justified due to the rapid speciation um, of the ethylene glycol ligand in solution, effectively meaning that the desired oxidative addition cannot occur in time um, prior to speciation. When the boron atom in the homologation reagent is um, sp3, um, in the case of the BF3K and the B mida, you can also see that the reaction um, shuts down entirely. Um, and this suggests that not only do we require a, an alpha relationship in our homologation relation reagent, we also require the boron atom to be sp2 hybridized. So moving into the stroke now, we can see that this developed process is quite general um, and can tolerate a variety of different sterics and electronics. 
In particular, we've generally found with this reaction that ortho substitution um, can be tolerated quite well, especially in cases where the substituent on the ortho position is electron rich. And we think what this allows the uh, reagent to do is reduce the rate of speciation. You can see that several um, different heterocycles are prepared and the reaction is generally scalable as well. For full disclosure though there are some limitations to this work that aren't actually encountered in the classical Madison chemistry and that is mainly that alkyl and styrol bronic esters do not undergo coupling under our conditions um, and these are sorts of substrates that have been used um, time and time again under Madison and Ardwell type best base methods. Unprotected heteroatoms that would classically not tolerate or um, Madison chemistry are also not tolerated in this homologation procedure um, because the carbanion equivalent is also an excellent alkylating reagent and so you tend to see very complex reaction mixtures when the unprotected heteroatoms are at play. This reaction does come with some significant practical advantages though, especially in relation to the Madison. In our setup, we just use microwave vials um, and charge up the solids, then cap and purge with inner atmosphere. The solvent that we add doesn't need to be dry, but it is degassed. Um, and then the carbon ion equivalent can be then added in a single portion, followed by water, and the reaction is just then left to stir overnight. Overall, this culminates um, in a total setup time of roughly 15 minutes, um, rather than the hours of both setup and monitoring required for classical mass and chemistry. If we want to scale this reaction up, we have um, two options um, in our lab, either using the slightly wider um, microwave vials that go up to 20 millilitres, um, or if we want to scale up even further, we can just use um, a classic two-neck round bottom flask with a reflux condenser um, attached to an inner atmosphere. And again, we don't need to flame dry here. We, can, we just need to purge the solids. So in this initial phase of the project, we've managed to overcome the synthesis of what appeared to be a relatively simple but hard to access benzyl bronic ester using a palladium catalyzed Born homologation. And from the empirical evidence that we've generated in a series of control studies, we've managed um, to establish that this reaction appears to be dependent on an alpha boral effect on the electrophile, consistent with Madison's original reports um, of 1-2 metallate rearrangements using uh, reagents of this class. So what we now wanted to do was actually go back into the um, initial project phase which was to try and develop a divergent syn a synthetic approach towards the synthesis of benzyl CX bonds. We turned first to the Suzuki coupling via for the CC bond formation. So we've developed conditions um, in our group that use stoichiometric water to liberate only quantities, small quantities of one cast at one time, effectively ensuring that that unstable benzyl bronic acid that I've mentioned previously um, is used al almost immediately as soon as it's formed at transmetallation and therefore cannot degrade in solution. And these prescribed conditions you can see from a small scope um, are generally very good across the board with heterocycles being tolerated from either the benzyl bronic ester or the aryl bromide. And as an interesting aside we can also take this bifunctional product um, containing the power chloride that was tolerated in the homologation scope and do the benzylation without undergoing a protohalogenation. Um, and so this chloride can be retained for onwards cross-coupling. But what we can also do is drop the loading of water and use an aryl bronic ester. And now we can couple the chloride flank um, to the southern portion of this molecule without undergoing protoboronation or hydrolysis of the benzyl bronic ester. Again, allowing us to gain full control as to which linchpin we want to use for onward synthetic chemistry. So now to apply um, the synthesis to our drug scaffolds, we can do the developed homologation and ventilation procedures, followed by one pot Wolsey Labromination SN2 sequence to access both bifonazole and cyclosine in just three steps, with similar yields to those reported um, within the pattern literature. You can see that this route can be used for more sensitive functional groups because we're generally using much milder conditions and namely no reductants, allowing us to then consider the synthesis of drug derivatives in an SAR screen. And indeed, this is what we did for the meclizine core. So in the same fashion, we can take that chloride product um, from our homologation scope benzylate, and then we can use the Wolziedler product in a series of different manipulations. We did a series of alkylations using amines and alcohols to offer variations to both the chain length and the heteroatom position. Um, alternatively, we actually deleted one of those 
nitrogen heteroatom by doing a Suzuki cross coupling with this um, with this B pin at the bottom here. We then wanted to extend the benzyl B pins application towards CX bond formation and started at the etherification. In the literature, there was a report from Kanonobu um, using catalytic copper acetate to generate a very small scope of benzyl ethers in relatively low yields. But following a screening campaign, um, we ultimately ended up favouring a stoichiometric copper regime using both cheap and abundant copper acetate rather than relying on any complex ligand systems which we thought would be more appropriate for an industrial application. And you can see here that these channel lamps performed particularly well um, for channel lamp coupling and halides were tolerated for onward manipulations going further. Naturally, when we thought of CO bond formation through this project, we also considered that synthesis of alcohols themselves would be very easy by just doing a direct brown oxidation. And these yields generally reflect the yield of the homologation reaction followed by quantitative oxidation to the alcohol, all of which can be performed in a single manipulation within the microwave file. When it came to the amination reaction though, a set of conditions for the amination of secondary alcohol um, bronic esters were previously reported by the Partridge group, group using a stoichiometric copper regime and relatively um, simple components. So despite us going through um, optimization on, the, on this reaction system, we actually couldn't find conditions that were any better than those previously reported just without the benzyl bronic esters. So gratifyingly, we were able to take our newly accessed benzyl bronic ester products and apply them towards this Chan Lam amination um, with good yields observed throughout. And in particular with that central example, being able to get heterocycles um, from both portions of the molecule being tolerated. So to summarize, we've been able to develop a palladium catalyzed organoboron homologation as a possible alternative to classical mats in chemistry to avoid the need to use stoichiometric organometallic reagents. And I found that this chemistry is dependent on a rare and facile oxidative addition of a halomethyl boronic ester to palladium. We've then utilized these previously inaccessible linchpins to prepare a variety of benzyl CX bonds which can be quickly made into pharmaceutical targets with both yields and step counts that are competitive with current industrial processes. And this is just to give some direction to the two publications that I've discussed today. Um, so the ACS totalysis contains the initial homologation reaction um, and our mechanistic controls. And any application towards medchem and diversity oriented synthesis has been reported in this synlet. Finally, I would just like to thank Matt again um, to, for inviting me along to this synthesis workshop and share some of the research that we do in, here in the Watson lab. I, of course, would like to thank Alan for his support throughout this project and my PhD um, and the entirety of the Watson group. In particular, um, Iona Meyer, who is now at AstraZeneca, was a master's student of mine who did some early control studies that eventually allowed us to fully optimise this reaction and take it all the way through. So thank you very much for listening. And if you have any queries, please do send a message to um, Synthesis Workshop. Thank you, Jane, for presenting your interesting chemistry. If you enjoyed the episode, please introduce us to your friends and peers, follow us on Twitter, and join us next time.